Hello friend, my name is Michael Escudi. In this video and those following, I want to address this question. What happens when atoms come together? Or in other words, how do atoms interact? What are the various different ways? And I would like to uh, begin by asking you to consider two cases. Case one has two atoms that are fairly par far apart. And we'll call this atom one. And then atom two over here. And these are far apart. What are the forces that go on between these? Why don't you write them down? Okay, well, um, I will tell you some of the ones that occur to me. Well, first of all, these atoms have mass. So gravity is one of the forces that can what? Pull them together, right? So it's going to pull them together. Um, what other forces could there be? Well, there can be also electromagnetic forces because there could be charges either uh, as a net charge or a dipole kind of charge on, on um on these these kinds of atoms and that's another way that these interact through forces when they're far apart and of course that can be either um, either way right it can either push them apart or pull them closer together alright so let's consider case two and in this case what I'd like you to think about are two atoms that are now really close together. And I'd like you to think about, well, what are the forces that go on there? Well, it turns out, of course, that there's still gravity, there's still electromagnetic forces, but there's a new force, and that is a force that's called the strong nuclear force. And this is the force that pushes them apart when they get too close together. And it has to do with the interaction of the uh, nuclei, especially. And that is almost never overcome unless it's inside a, a star or some other kind of uh, cataclysmic explosion on the atomic uh, scale. All right, so these are these two cases, and these are the forces that go on to, um, to influence how atoms relate to one another. Now... I'd like to ask you to complete this sentence. Write this down in your notes and see if you can answer this before I give you the answer. So atoms interact to form solids, liquids, gases, in order to what? Why do atoms interact to form solids, liquids, and gases? Well, the, the one answer that I like is to minimize energy. All right, so when atoms come together to form solids, liquids, and gases, what they're doing is minimizing the energy of their relationships, whether it's two atoms or whether it's a whole bunch of atoms. And so I'd like to understand that. And um, let's also remember a, another example that is somewhat relevant here. If we have a landscape here, something like this hill, and... This is the ground below this hill and this little valley, this little dip that I've drawn here. And if we have a person or I suppose a ball or a bicycle or something else like that, um, we would expect that gravity would pull this person down this way, right? If the person was here. If the person was over here, on this side,
then of course gravity would pull this person down this way. Now why is gravity doing this? Well let's think about it in terms of potential energy and the key thing to remember is that this is an example of minimizing the potential energy due to gravity at least in a local sense all right so we see this all the time and this shouldn't surprise us very much now let's consider the case of two atoms um, and let's talk about potential energy for just a moment regarding atoms all right so this is the potential energy between two atoms and I want to draw a graph and draw the graph of the potential energy between two atoms and see if you can um, predict what this is going to look like so this will be the distance between two atoms on this axis and this will be the zero distance and then this will be potential energy all right, so we can call this E, which is the potential energy. All right, and um, let's draw the atoms just for the fun of it. So we suppose we've got some kind of atom with um, a nuclei that is very prominent and has lots of protons in it, neutrons. And uh, around it, we have, of course, the electron cloud which really is a whole bunch of orbitals and so these little dots represent the electrons alright so here we go we have our electrons around there and the separation distance between these guys is going to be X alright so this is the distance X and so what I'm asking is here what do you think the, elect the potential energy is uh, of these this pair of atoms compared uh, or at least as a function of X well I hope uh, from your past or from just thinking it through we see that the potential energy takes a shape that's kind of a um, a kind of bowl shape and um, and it starts on the left side as needing a very high potential energy to get very close to one another and then there's a minimum and then far away when X gets larger and larger it tends towards zero and what this means of course is that right around here there is a minimum uh, potential energy that will wind up being the equilibrium separation distance and that is um, something that is going to be different for different atoms and for um, perhaps for different temperatures and uh, this energy is called the binding energy and I hope that makes sense to you because if the atoms are pulled very far apart from this position then we would have to add this much energy to the system right so this is the energy it takes to unbind these two atoms together and then this distance here which is distance in X is simply the equilibrium separation alright so this general curve here which we've drawn in a very rough way is the potential energy of two atoms coming together and that's the the most important part of what we're about to to begin with so let's take an example of two hydrogen atoms and let's draw the actual potential energy and give some numbers to it All right, very simply, we've got this same axis. And we have our curve, which goes something like this. And um, I want to give some numbers to this minimum here. So this minimum 
is something that occurs at 74 picometers. All right, that's 10 to the minus 12 meters. And then over here, this is the binding energy, and this is minus 432. And the units on this are kind of a funny unit, but not, not so bad. Kilojoules per mole. All right, there's many ways to express this potential energy, but a popular one is kilojoules per mole. All right, so this 74 picometers for two hydrogen atoms is, of course, very small. And, uh, but these are some, some of the numbers, right? So if we're out um, in this portion, out here, with our atoms, then they are being attracted to each other. And if we are somewhere over here, they're being attracted to each other even more. In this position, it's the equilibrium position, so they will uh, tend to stay here. And then over here in this position, they will want to repel, right? So that's the basic idea. All right, now let's, let's be a little bit more detailed about what we've just said. And let's consider potential energy and force in a more rigorous way. All right, so how does the potential energy relate to force? Well, there's a very straightforward expression that you should keep in mind, namely that the force associated with a particular potential energy landscape of any kind, whether it's gravity or electromagnetic or this kind of atomic potential energy, the force is going to be equal to minus or negative the derivative of the energy with respect to x. All right, and if we have a potential energy of the shape that we just graphed, well, that's not very straight. Let me draw that again. Such that we have this is x, and then in the vertical direction, we have uh, potential energy um, and force. So here we're going to graph energy. And with a different color, I want to graph force. All right, so with my, um, my first color, blue, I want to draw this curve that we've drawn already before. And this will be the energy curve. And if we take the derivative of that curve, I know it's not terribly obvious uh, just by looking at it, but we can. And it's going to wind up being a similar shaped curve where the derivative of the potential energy turns out to be 0 at this point, at the equilibrium. And then, so actually, it's, it's got pretty much the same kind of shape. And there's, of course, better, um, better figures uh, and illustrations and graphs in your textbook that will help you see this. But what I want you to see is that, of course, this point where the force crosses the 0 axis is going to occur at the minimum of the potential energy, right? And so what this means is that for this portion up here, for um, this region of this graph, this is going to mean positive energy. And it's going to mean repulsive force. Whereas down here in this part of the graph, it's going to mean negative energy. And it's going to mean attractive force. Right, so I hope that makes sense to you. Where um, in this portion, the force is positive and it is repelling the two atoms apart. Whereas in this portion, it is attracting them together. All right, and then eventually, um, it, it's possible to pull 
the atoms so far apart that they no longer are attractive and then they are basically independent. All right, so there are many different functions and, um, and ways to describe that curve. I want to give you perhaps the most uh, useful one for us here in this course, and that's going to be the Leonard Jones approximation. All right, so that's the Leonard Jones approximation. All right, so what does this look like? Well, again, looks like this curve that we've been drawing many times now. Where the potential energy, the interaction energy, is a curve that is positive, very close to zero, comes down, has a minimum, and then as x gets larger, the potential energy converges towards zero. All right, so what's the equation that describes this? Well, one approximation as a function that is often very useful is this one. It's dependent on um, a constant, which is a binding energy. And that constant then is multiplying all the stuff in this bracket. Two times a radius, subscript VDW, and we'll see what that is very shortly. It stands for van der Waals. And then, so that first term is proportional to x to the minus 12th power as you can see. And then this one, the second term is proportional to negative x to the minus 6 power. Okay, and so this is the Leonard-Jones approximation and if you graph this, and I invite you to do it yourself, you'll see that it looks something like this when you have reasonable values chosen for these constants. And, um, alright, so this is the um, Van der Waals radius, I guess I should mark this. All right, and as we just said, if we want to know the force, of course, as a function of x, we can do that, and it's minus the derivative of the energy. And if we write that out, it's not so hard. It's just a polynomial after all. Well, we still have that constant, right? 2 times r to the power of 12. And then, because of the derivative, we now have in the denominator x to the power of 13. And then this is also then minus a term that is proportional to x to the power of 7. All right, so just, just taking the derivative. And what I want to show you here is, is how these two come together. Basically, one of the terms is the term that is the asymptote this way, and this is an attractive force. And, of course, this energy is proportional to 1 over x to the power of 6. And then this part of the curve is proportional to a repulsive force that is approximately, or at least a portional, proportional to 1 over x to the 12. Right, So that's the energy curve. And then, of course, the particular uh, constants then uh, associate these two asymptotes and give us the net 
blue curve. All right, so we're almost done here for this video. The last thing I want to do is identify the four types of bonds that we will be interested in. Um, and so these are the atomic and molecular bonds that we will review. So there's four different types. So first of all, there are ionic bonds. Second, covalent. Third, metallic. And fourth, van der Waals bonds. And in the next videos, we'll go through each of these.